today, Colossians 3, 1, 2, and 7. I want to talk to you just for a few minutes this morning on the subject, what this new life produces. Would you stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word? In verse 1, Colossians 3, the Bible says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And then in verse number 7, he says, In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated. The last message from Colossians 3 dealt with what produced this life. And I just listed five things. I mentioned that this new life, when we say I'm a Christian, I'm a new creation, any man in Christ is a new creation, old things are passed away, behold all things are become new. And a person says, I've been saved. They use the terminology of Jesus Christ. And they say, I've been born again. Those are biblical statements. And someone may say, well, uh, what produced this new life? Well, what produced it, first of all, is you've been identified with Jesus Christ. And the Bible just mentions just sort of many statements, micro statements of what happened. He says in verse number three, you died. And so I experienced death to the old man, the Bible teaches. And then in verse number one, he says, and you were raised. So I identified with Jesus Christ in his death. I identified with Jesus Christ in his resurrection. The Bible says where Christ is seated at the right hand of God in verse one. And now there's been an ascension. And now I'm seated in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says that my life is hidden with Christ in God. In verse number three, so now I spoke about that secrecy of there's this new life that no one who has not experienced that life can genuinely comprehend or understand it based on John chapter 14. And then he says that one day this person who gave you this new life is going to appear again. And when he does, you will be caught up with him. And the word rapture is not in the New Testament, but the word rapture translates called up, and the word called up is in there. Call it what you will. He's coming back, and when he does, I'm going up. And so the Bible teaches we'll be raptured with him. So that's what produced this new life. But this morning, we're going to focus a little bit on what this new life produces. And then he's going to give us some warnings, and God willing, next Sunday morning. God willing, we'll deal with that. Now, one major truth is for sure. This new life that God gives us in Jesus Christ brings major changes that have the potential of allowing each of us to make a significant difference in this life and in the life to come. So this passage is all about contrast. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. He talks about things which are above and things which are on the earth. He talks about a person who's died, and yet he makes emphasis on their life. So what I want to deal with this morning is just two simple statements. First of all, when I think about what this new life produces, it produces a new attitude. I don't have the same attitude I had before Jesus Christ became my Lord and Savior. Let me ask you this. Pastor, can you have the tendency by not obeying God to carry on more of the characteristics of your old attitude than the new? Absolutely. But what is it about this new life? This new life gave me a new nature, a new power, a new opportunity that I can choose by God to obey God and have his attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If he made that statement, it's speaking of the reality and the possibility that I can have a new attitude. Now, does he say anything about what we ought to do as a result of this new attitude? He certainly does. He says, I want you, first of all, to take this attitude that I've given you, this new mind that I've given you, this new mindset that I've given you, and I want you to start seeking things that are above. Now, just what in the world does that mean? One of my favorite verses in the Bible, I emailed someone this morning with this passage. 
is Isaiah 26, 3. He says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Sometimes it's difficult to focus our minds on things above and on Christ. And so maybe we get a bad report from the doctor and it's extremely difficult not to find ourselves focusing in on that report. Maybe you're in a storm and most of your attention's on the storm, a health issue, a job's potential whatever it may be but he's saying listen if you have this new life in Christ I've moved you to a new dimension and I'm going to encourage you to start seeking things that are above it's referring to a diligent pursuit that I'm being called into it means a preoccupation with the eternal realities that are ours in Christ it is to be the pattern of the believer's life uh, God is saying you've been going so long with this old attitude, but now you've worn a rut in there, but now let's begin a new process. I'm going to take you down a new road, and you can begin to view things differently. And I'm telling you, if that's true, I want to lock into it and allow it to become a reality in my life, and I believe with all my heart that it is. In fact, listen to what Jesus said in John 8, 23. And Jesus said to them, you are from beneath. You're earthlings. But I'm from above. I'm a heavenly creature. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. Wow. And he says, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to change your entire mi mindset where you're able to start thinking more about heaven and the influence it can have in your life instead of just earth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, the apostle Paul was catching on to what Jesus was saying, and he said, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Is that not what a person goes to their knees for? I know what it looks like. I know what I'm facing, but I don't know what God is facing. I want to go into prayer, and I want to get God's mindset, God's attitude, so I can become aware of what he's aware of, and so I can view this differently. And he says, I want to remind you that the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And God says, I'm going to move you into a mindset where you can start to see some things the way I see some things. And by the way, I want to be quick to say, if God will help me to see some stuff the way God sees some stuff, I will see stuff differently. And so he says, I want you to start seeking above. We're to view the things, people, and events of this world through the eyes and with an eternal purpose. He's saying, seek those things which are above. In other words, it is to see to it that one's interests are centered in Jesus Christ, that one's attitudes, ambitions, and whole outlook on life are modeled by Christ's relation to the believer, and that one's allegiance to Jesus Christ takes precedence over all earthly allegiances. You have heard some say, uh, that man is so heavenly minded, he is no earthly good. However, I say, if he is not heavenly minded, he will never be any earthly good. He's saying, I want you to set your mind on things above. Things above in contrast to things below. James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, took the sacred pen in the epistle of James and listened to the words he penned because I want all the understanding I can have on things that are ab above and things that are below. So listen to what he said. He said, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not ascend, descend from above. It didn't come down from heaven. But it's earthly. It's down here is where you found it. It's sensual and it's demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And then he said, but let me tell you what comes down from above. But wisdom that is from above is first in priority, pure. Then it's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good works, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so he says, seek that which is above. Uh, just reflect on the fact. Here's what I am faced with, the choices of my life. Here, here's what I ought to do with my life as it pertains vocational. And then seek above. Get your affection on Jesus Christ. Give me God's attitude, the mind of Christ that is mine, based on 1 Corinthians 2.16. And with that in mind, I want to think the way he wants me to think. And then he goes a step further. And he says, if, if you're raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. 
And then he says in verse 2, set your mind on things above. Translate, set your affections. Let me ask you something. Do you have an affection for heaven? I don't want to think about it too much. You know what I mean? Life is short down here. That's even more reason to think about it (laughs) because we're headed there. Uh, Most of you have moved before in your life. There may be someone here this morning and say, I still live in the home I was born in. That's unusual unless you're extremely young. Most of us will move, but the Bible teaches there's coming a day that God's going to translate us from this world to a heavenly home where we'll be forever. And he says, I want, you to, I want you to get to the place in your life when you're making decisions in your life. Always do it in light of eternity. Think about heaven. And so when he says, set your affection on things above, and then he says in contrast, and not on the things of the earth. I hear people all the time saying, well, God must be moving me to... Um, Utah, why why is God moving you to Utah? You just got saved here and you just started growing in the Lord. Oh, it's got to be God. The the money's 20% more than what I make. Set your things on things above, not on things of the earth. I'm telling you, the, the economy of glory is different than the economy of down here. And we need to say, is this the will of God for my life? Will God be glorified? Can I eternally say this is what God wants me to do? Let every decision be made in that context. He's saying you must not only seek heaven, listen to me carefully, you must also think heaven. It connotes giving such things a large place in one's thought life. Now, listen to that. That's just how, did you know that we have cliches that are unscriptural? And somebody says he's so heavenly minded he's no earthly good. That's a bunch of hogwash. It's impossible. I tell you, the more you've got your mind on where you're headed, the more you'll do a better job headed there. And so he's calling us to keep our minds there, seeing to it that the bent of the inner nature, the governing tendency of thought and will is toward God. William Barclay made this statement on this passage. He said, their will has this this difference. From now on, the Christian will see everything in the light and against the backdrop of eternity. He will no longer live live as if this world was all that mattered. Did you know it's easy to live as though all that matters is this world? Everything's just wrapped up in ever how many years you're here. But he says when God gets in it and he puts his affection on things above, he will see this world against the backdrop of the larger world of eternity. One thing's for sure, the longer we live, we have more people on the other side than we do this side. He said, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. And by the way, let me just be quick to say, uh, not all on this earth is evil. Even things that are harmless in themselves become harmful if permitted to take the place that should be reserved for the things above. Uh, wealth sometimes all we think about is our wealth and what we can do with it here our worldly honor what it means here power and pleasure what it means here so to make such things the goal of life and the subject of preoccupation is unworthy he says of those who have been raised with Christ and look forward to sharing in his life A.T. Robinson that wonderful Greek scholar just took this verse and made one connotation He says, it does matter what we think, and we are responsible for our thoughts. Robert Molek said, believers value and love, uh, values and loves were to be focused on the rule of Christ, and consecrated energies were to be devoted to making that rule a reality on earth. So here's the word. The yielded Christian makes no distinction between the sacred and the secular. To him, everything must be done for the glory of God. And this includes personal and family and social responsibilities. However, he must differentiate between that which is beneficial and that which is a detriment to his spiritual health. So Paul does not mean that we should never think about the things on the earth, but that those should not be our ultimate aim, our ultimate goal, or our master. But instead, there's life beyond this life. Many have said that this life is a dress rehearsal for eternity. And if that's true, how you doing? 
Romans 12, 2 is a warning to all of us. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. And the word conform means, here's a good translation, simple way to see it. Don't let this world squeeze you into its mold where your attitude is all fixed on this world, all your ambitions, goals, and achievements only have the value of this earthly life. But let God transform your mind, and he does it from the inside out, and he does it by renewing your mind through the word of God, and you begin to prove what's good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Philippians 4.8 just tells us what we ought to think on. All the things that are good and holy and pure, there's virtue in this, he's teaching. Meditate on this. He says, what I want you to do is take this down into your heart, bring it back up again, take it down in your heart, and just constantly be thinking and setting your affection on these things. We are to preoccupy ourselves with God's purposes, God's plan, God's provision, God's power. So the believer's whole disposition should orient itself toward heaven. Some of the songwriters of old wrote a lot of songs helping us remember that this life is a journey and this place called earth is not our home, that we're just passing through. And so if I'm just passing through and I'm going somewhere else, why am I even here to pass through? I believe I'm passing through to take as many with me as I can to where I'm going. But I can't do it if I keep my mind focused down here. I've got to keep my mind focused there as well. And that's where my ambitions should lie. So he says such values dominating the mind produces a godly behavior. No one says keep your heart with all diligence. Out of your heart's going to spring these issues of life. He's with the Lord now. He was the first man to ever teach me how to open my Bible and try to give the understanding of a text. He taught me preaching. His name was Stephen Olford. Stephen Olford said, the heart is the center of thinking, our feelings and our actions, and so controls our life. As our bodily health depends on the action of the heart, so our moral health depends on the function of the new heart, new mind. Setting your affections there. The Bible says in this mind that we have, God will guard it with peace. Military form. Statement that is used, reminding us that our mind is the battle zone of our lives that must be protected by armed forces. And so if that's true, what is he protecting our mind against? Because our mind can be so controlled by the thoughts of this world that we really don't think as much as we ought about the life of before us Harry Henry Harry Ironside said as a watch is set to the sun in order to mark the time correctly so let your mind be set to Christ risen in order that his life may be seen in you it's a new attitude new attitude I'm gonna go a step further if I got a new attitude I ought to have my mind thinking about things that are above and seeking it and I ought to have my affection set on things above. But there's not just a new attitude's been produced. I have a new awareness. Did, did you know I'm aware of some things I used to not be aware of? Matter of fact, I'm aware of some things I used to not care to be aware of. And so what he does in verse number 7 is why I read it, and you certainly can't understand it without verse 5, but I don't have time to deal with verse 5. I'll deal with that next week, Lord willing. But look at verse 5. If you have your Bible sitting in your lap, It says, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, let me just make this statement to maybe set a fire in your heart for a sermon next week. All five words is just God's way of saying something over and over five ways. It's really the same thing. Every one of those words speak into the context of sexual sin, without exception. I thought that was interesting. Every word, even the covetousness. And then he says, and all of this is idolatry. Now he says, now, he's putting in the context, that's the way it used to be in your life. And look at verse number six. Because of this thing, he said, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And then he says, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. And I'm going to address this question next week. He refers to it in the past tense. You used to walk that way. Let me ask you the question. If you don't allow God to keep you in the context of seeking things above in a diligent pursuit, 
setting your affection on things of eternal significance, is it possible that those who genuinely know Jesus Christ oftentimes revert back to the areas where they once walked? But I'm telling you, my Bible says, Johnny Hunt, I gave you new life, and with that new life, I can give you a new attitude, but you're going to have to make a diligent pursuit to seek these things which are above and not on the earth. And what does he say about the earth? He said the earth things are demonic and sensual. Why didn't he use some other words? Because he knew that in the first century and in the 21st century that the sensual would be the greatest battle on this earth and he knew that the greatest battle is the battle for the mind and that's why he said that if you will commit your mind to me the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your mind guard your heart any man or woman here that doesn't need their heart and their mind guarded armed forces he said I'll set up armed forces at your heart and mind and when somebody tries to penetrate it they'll have to come through me And I want to make another statement while I'm at it. Keep wetting your appetite for next week. I can't help it. Something got hold of me when I started looking at next week's sermon. Without his armed forces, you're no match for the enemy today that's robbing so many homes. And so the battle's in your mind. You think you can. He says, you can't, Johnny. Set your mind on things above. Set your affection. Put your love on things above. That's why when I get up every morning, when I go to my devotional time, you know what I'm doing? Trying to get my mind up there. Jesus Christ taught me a great lesson. I heard this a long time ago. The life of God's son was much like the pendulum on a clock. In the morning, he swung in to a quiet solid place of solitude to spend time with his father. And then he swung back out into the world to touch him. And the next morning, he swung back in. I hear people every now and then say, when should, a preacher, when should a Christian do their devotional time? Somebody says, it don't matter. Of course it matters. Do it in the morning. And you know what ought to cause us to have the attitude of Christ and want to set our things above? Because of what he did with our past. We can think about it right now. By the way, here's another statement that the Holy Ghost of God put in my heart. I'm going to give him credit because I've never heard anybody say it. I've heard people say when you get saved, God gives you the capacity to forget your past. No, he forgets your past, but you never forget it. And by the way, if he thought for one moment that you would forget it or had the capacity to forget it, he'd have never told the Holy Ghost to lead a writer to say, and remember your past life. I would have to holler and say, wait just a minute, Paul. You just said in verse number 7, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. I'm not supposed to remember what I lived in. Oh, yes, you are. You will have a greater appreciation of the marvelous grace of God if you'll remember where he brought you from. It'll make you want to seek him. Oh, yeah. Would you not agree with this statement? We all know to some degree what it was like, listen to me, to be controlled by sin. We all know, yeah. Oh, yes, sir, we all know. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5 talks about it. Talks about a life in which I once walked. Anytime the Bible says there's a life in which you once walked, he's using that once walked as a sharp contrast to the way we walk now. And the reason we can walk differently now is because I've got a new attitude. <laughs> I'm not thinking just the earth anymore. I'm thinking heaven. I'm not just thinking about where I live now. I'm thinking about where I'm going to live forever. I'm not just thinking about what the deacons might think. I'm thinking about the beam of the judgment seat of Christ. So I'm thinking heaven. If the American church in my lifetime ever goes to two-hour worship, I'll preach the whole text and be able to uh, bring conclusion to the message. Until then, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, there's some more stuff I want to tell, but I feel like that I can lean on your promise this morning 
where you said, and the Spirit of God will lead us into all truth. So I'm going to believe that you're going to take over and already are in charge, and I praise you for it and say a few things I didn't say so we can be helped. Make us aware of the war that is waging and make us aware of the armed forces that have come from heaven to help us overcome. In Jesus' name, as pastor of this fellowship, may I be the first to submit to you and say, Lord, lead me in such a way that I'd never bring reproach to your name, your body, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my loved ones, my friends, and the greater body of Christ around the world. May our attitudes be renewed every morning as we reflect in thy word. Draw us to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.